Hello, Maniac McGee, installment number 12, and we are officially on part two, and we're on chapter 22. Oh, hey, side note, this wall behind me, my great uncle built this wall. He gathered all the stones, and you can see there's a fossil here. Bonus points if you can find out what kind of fossil that is. I can zoom in and adjust this. Hmm. Pretty cool. Anyway, this whole wall behind me and around the corner is all stone that he gathered. All right, side note over. Chapter 22. If you were a baby buffalo at the Elmwood Park Zoo, maybe it would have gone something like this. You wake up, you have breakfast, compliments of mother's milk, you mosey on over to the lean-to. Surprise! A strange new animal is in there. Bigger than you, but a lot smaller than mom. Hair, but only on the top of its head. Sitting in the straw, munching on a carrot, like mom does. Every morning, same thing. You get to expect it. Some mornings you forget mom's milk and head right over to the lean-to. The creature offers you a carrot, but all you know how to deal with is milk. You nuzzle the new, funny-smelling, hairy-headed animal. It nuzzles you back. Mom doesn't seem to mind. After the nuzzling, the stranger climbs over the fence and goes away, not to return until that night. Only one morning, the stranger falls from the fence, lies on the ground on the other side. It doesn't move. You try to poke your nose through the chain links, but you can't reach. You can only watch. Only watch. The old man was bumping through the zoo in the park pickup when he spotted the body clumped outside the buffalo pen. He wheeled over, got out. A kid! At first he could only stare at the body and then at the baby bison whose large brown eyes seemed to be watching them both. The mother came lumbering over, nodding as if to confirm. A kid. The kid looked terrible. His clothes were scraps, rags. Wherever his body showed through, it was bony and dirty and scratched. The two bison, staring, staring, seemed to say, Well, do something. The old man gathered his old, old own bones and his muscles as best he could, and he managed to hoist the kid and get him into the pickup. He laid him on the seat, bent his legs so he could close the door. He knew he should take the kid straight to the hospital or to a doctor, someplace official, someplace right. But the pickup just sort of steered itself back to the band shell, and there he was, lugging the kid into the baseball equipment room. The season was over by now, but the army green burlap bag still stood ready for the next ump to call, play ball! He yanked out a couple of chest protectors and he laid the kid down carefully with his head on top of them. At least the kid was breathing. Although it wasn't cold, it seemed as if the kid ought to be covered up. So the old man took his winter work jacket off the hook and he laid that over him. And then he waited and watched. With trembling, dusty fingers, he touched the kid's limp, scrawny hand. He had never held, never really touched a kid's hand before. Hey. The kid's voice was barely a squeak, but it threw him back. He dropped the hand. What, where am I? The old man cleared his throat. <clears> the <throat> band shell. The band shell? Uh, yeah, in the back, the equipment room. The kid's eyes squinted and blinked. And, and you? What about me? Who, who are you? Grayson. Grayson, do I know you? He got up. Oh, I guess you do now. He went to his hot plate and he heated up some water and he made some chicken noodle cup of soup. He gave it to the kid who was sitting up now. You want a spoon? He looked as though he could hardly lift the cup. He held it with both hands and he gulped it down. Huh? The kid said. Never mind. You still hungry? The kid flopped back down. A little. Wait here, said Grayson, and he left. Ten minutes later, he was back with a zep. Remember, that's what it was. It was like a, a hoagie, a zeppelin. It was a large. It took the kid less time to polish it off than it had taken Grayson to go get it. He told the kid not to eat so fast because he would get sick, and the kid nodded. Grayson said, 
Where'd you get them scratches? Oh, some picker bush. What were you doing there? Hiding. Hiding? From who? Some kids. Where? The kid pointed. Somewhere out there. Some other town. He crossed his legs Indian style on the chest protectors. Can I ask you for a favor? Shoot. Can we go somewhere and get some butterscotch crimpets? Grayson squawked. Crimpets? You're still hungry? Well, for them I am. Grayson threw the greasy Zep wrapper into the wastebasket. I don't know. Maybe you ought to do something for me first. Like what? Like, tell me your name. Oh, it's Jeffrey McGee. Where do you live? Well, I did live on Sycamore Street, 728. You did? I guess I don't anymore. The man stared. Did you say Sycamore? Yep. Ain't that the East End? Yep. With his fingernail, he scraped a, a path of dirt off of the kid's forearm. He stared at it. What are you doing? The kid asked. I'm seeing if you was white under there. Neither of them spoke for a while. At last, the kid said, Anything else you want to ask me? The old man shrugged. Guess not. Ah, uh, come on. Don't stop asking. Well, I'm asked out. Well... How about the zoo, huh? Don't you want to know what I was doing at the zoo, at the buffalo pen? The old man sighed. <sighs> okay, what? I was living there. With the buffaloes? Yep, with the buffaloes. You like buffaloes? Well, it was dark when I got there. I thought it was the deer pen. Oh, they switched the deer and the buffaloes around last month. <clears throat> well, that's okay with me. I get along better with the buffaloes anyway. Well, I'll tell you one thing, the old man said, sniffing. You sure do smell like one. The kid laughed. They both laughed. And when they finally calmed down, the kid said, Any chance of those crimpets now? Grayson reached for the pickup keys. Let's go. Chapter 23 Grayson got the crimpets all right, and he brought a whole box of three packs. With ten packs to a box, that was thirty butterscotch crimpets. Maniac thought he must have climbed out of the buffalo pen and right into heaven. Then, Grayson took Maniac home. Home for the old man was the Two Mills YMCA. He lived in a room on the third floor, but he didn't take Maniac up there. He took him downstairs to the locker room. He got him a towel and a cake of soap, and he told him to take off his rags, and he pointed the way to the shower. Maniac stayed in the shower for an hour. He hadn't done this since the last bath with the little ones. He smiled at the thought of them shrieking and splashing. The shower needles stung his scratches, but it was a good welcome back to town scratching, or stinging, pardon me. When Maniac finally forced himself from the shower, he found the old man waiting with clothes, Grayson's clothes. I called the U.S. Army in to haul them buffalo rags away, he said. They come in with gas masks on, they use tongs to pick them up, and they put them in a steel box. And they took that box away to bury it at the bottom of the first mine shaft they come to. Maniac couldn't stop laughing, and neither could Grayson, especially when he got a load of the kid drowning in his clothes. An hour later, after a minor shopping spree, Maniac had clothes of his own. For the rest of the afternoon, they cruised around town, talking and eating crimpets. So, said the old man, now what are you going to do? Maniac thought it over. How about a job? I mean, I could work for the park like you. Grayson didn't answer. He just said, where do you think you're going to stay? <clears throat> Maniac's answer was prompt. The baseball room. It's perfect. A tiny idea was beginning to worm its way into Grayson's head. He could barely feel it as it brushed by all the claptrap in his brain. He ignored it, and he said, What about school? Maniac was silent. Some butterscotch icing had stayed behind on the wrapper, and he scooped it up and mopped it up with his, from its finger, wishing it was Mrs. Beale's finger instead. Grayson, who was not comfortable asking questions, was even less comfortable waiting for answers. 
I said, what about school? Maniac turned to him. What about it? You gotta go. You're a kid, ain't you? I'm not going, he said. But you gotta, don't you? I mean, they'll make you. Not if they don't find me. The old man just looked at him for a while with a mixture of puzzlement and recognition, as though the fish he had landed might be the same one he had thrown away long before. Why? he asked. Maniac felt more than knew, uh, more than he knew why. It had to do with homes and families and schools and how a school seems sort of like a big home, but only a day home because then it empties out and you can't stay there at night because it's not really a home. And you could never use it as your address because an address is where you stay at night, where you walk right in the front door without knocking and where everybody talks to each other and uses the same toaster. So all the other kids would be heading for their homes, their night homes, each of them, like hundreds, flocking from school like birds from a tree, scattering across town, each breaking off to his or her own place, each knowing exactly where to land. School, home. Nope, he was not going to have one without the other. Well, if you try and make me, he said, I'll just start running. Grayson said nothing. What the kid said actually made him feel good, although he didn't have any idea why. And the brushing little worm of a notion was beginning to tickle him now. He kept on driving.